Hello, everybody. Whether you are a Swifty or a believer or something else uh, or not, you know, you know, it doesn't matter. We're just glad that you're here and you are welcome here. Uh, we are going to talk about today. One of the things is that we really are a come as you are church because that's the way God accepts us. And we're just glad that you're here. And for those of you who are new in our church, um, let me encourage you to take the step that Ashlyn just talked about, Chase Oaks Go. Whether you are online, you can find it on the app, or if you're in person, uh, you can show up this weekend on Sunday, and you'll be glad you did. It is a great way to not only find out what we're about, but also to help you take whatever next step might be appropriate in your journey, and just how we as a church can be helpful in that journey. So uh, Chase Oaks Go is a great way to do that. Also, the book that she talked about that you can get a free download of about the values and DNA of this place will answer a lot of questions about, man, why do they do that? Or why don't they do this? And probably there's a reason. And the reason has to do with one of our values, one of our DNA statements. And so I encourage you to, uh, to do that. So today we're finishing our series called Goat, the greatest of all time about Jesus and what it means to live like the greatest of all time, to live like Jesus and to become like Jesus by putting into practice the practices of Jesus. Because we don't actually become like Jesus by trying hard. We, we become like Jesus by really training, uh, meaning putting certain disciplines and practice into place. And as we do over time, we start to transform and God begins to meet us in those disciplines and change us. And each week we've been looking at these different disciplines. And if, it, if you're new to this, you can go on our app, the Chase Oaks app, and there's all these challenges. It's a 45 day challenge way to go, by the way, for those of you who've been through uh, to the 45 day challenge. There's a, a, a like a specific challenge for each week. And today's discipline is one that is super important. And was really core and key to the way Jesus lived. But it's the one that is often, most often, not part of the deal. And what I mean by that is this. So Christians often will talk about a process of transformation since Jesus had disciples. He was a rabbi with disciples or apprentices. They'll call that discipleship. So if you hang around church, you'll hear that. And... And there's certain things you do in, in a discipleship process, right? It's these disciplines. And we've covered a lot of like, you know, the ones that will always show up are things like prayer, you know, solitude so that we can pray and Bible, you know, submitting to the Bible we talked about and intentional community and serving like Ryan talked about last week. And those are absolutely important and absolutely vital and core. But the one we're going to talk about this week is one that typically is not in the plan. In fact, what typically happens is Christians get discipled away from what we're talking about today. And they become increasingly not, what, not around this. Like they don't do this discipline the longer they go. And the discipline we're talking about, the way it's worded, came from religious people who, who called Jesus this name, like a bad name, is a friend of sinners. So the Pharisees, religious people will talk about were so f confused and frustrated because Jesus was a friend of sinners. And they believed that if you were righteous, if you were religious, you should never be a friend of sinners, even though we're all sinners, including them. And we'll talk about that. But Jesus spent a lot of time with people who were, didn't know God. And he talked a lot about why, because that's why he came and that was his heart. But unfortunately, what often happens, and we'll see why this is a big problem, is that the longer you know Jesus, the less likely you are to hang out with people who don't and and the less likely you are to be far from God and what happens is is when that happens is we develop a very skewed religion a very skewed view of truth a very skewed relationship with God we become un-Jesus not like Jesus and we don't even know it's happening and it's so natural that it's probably happening to me right now and it's probably happening to you right now if you have known Jesus for a while. And yet, for those of you who don't know Jesus, you might think, well, great, I, you know, this is not going to apply to me today. It does. Because you want to be spiritually influential in the life of other people, too. You are on a journey, whether you know it or not. Even if you got here, you're at church today because you lost a bet or somebody guilted you into it, your mom or something. You're, I, God is still at work in your life. And I know you would want to be influential in the life of other people. And we're going to be talking about that. 
and, and why this is so important as a discipline. And the longer you know Jesus, the more of a discipline it is. And it does raise some questions as you start to think, well, okay, if I hang around with people labeled sinners, and, we'll, and again, everybody's a sinner, I'm a sinner, like everybody. But when we start doing that, there's raised lots of questions like, well, wait a minute, like do you just accept everybody and you don't, you don't stand for truth or you don't call thing, anything out or, you know, is that what we're talking about? Or, man, what if, what if you hang out with people and then they rub off on you? Like, is there ever a time to call a time out and, in, in you know, put boundaries in a relationship? Yes, but, but is there ever a time to do that? And we're going to talk about that as we learn from the goat of the greatest of all time, as he really was a friend of sinners. And the reason they called him that is because it was true. So what does that mean? Now, we're, gonna, uh, we're going to see that in one passage. It was so hard for me in this particular talk to just choose one. Because I could do, I wish I'd done a series just on this. And one day we may do that because it's all over his, the books about Jesus' life. But the one we're going to look at today, I'm excited about because it's a story of someone telling his story. It's Matthew, who is one of the 12 disciples, one of his closest apprentices, who wrote the book of Matthew about Jesus's life, telling this. And he tells the story of his invitation to become a disciple, even though he would have been considered the worst of sinners. And, and, And you see this person who comes to know Jesus as a friend of sinners who also lives as a friend of sinners, and it's in Matthew chapter 9. Now, as I read the story, I'm gonna, it's not that long, but as I read the whole story, it's kind of like a play. I don't know if you ever were, if you have growing up or whatever, you, if you ever did any theater or did any plays. When I was a kid, I did. Molly and the Invisible Giant, I remember I was the narrator. I was really proud of that. Um, and the Helen Keller thing, I forget what that's called. That was some indiscriminate part in that. But I, as you hear this story, I want, you to, I want you to consider and be really open. And just ask God the question, God, who do I most resemble in this story? Like there's three characters. It's Jesus, Matthew, and the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Which do I most resemble? And who would I love to resemble most? The answer is always Jesus, I know. But still, let's look at it. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Now, that's not just like saying to somebody, hey, follow me, I'm going to get a Coke or something. This was a, this was a rabbi inviting someone to be one of his disciples, which was a big deal. It was bigger than getting admitted to Harvard or getting the best job in the world. Like this was, a, this was the apex of opportunity in their culture. And so he jumps at it. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, why? Well, we learn from Luke that the first thing he does is throw a party and he invites all his friends, which would have been considered, all of them, and we'll see why in a minute, the the most notorious, most sinful of sinners around. And he throws a party for them so they can meet Jesus. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, so three characters. The first one, Jesus, who is called throughout by the Pharisees and religious leaders Their term for him, friend of sinners, which I don't know if you've ever, you probably have been called bad names and and I hate that. I'm sorry you've been called bad names. This was designed to be a bad name. This was designed to be a zinger. This was designed to sting. But Jesus wore it as a badge of honor, a friend of sinners. What does it mean to be a friend of sinners? Well, think about it. Maybe you're with a friend right now. Um, you know, maybe somebody invited you or if you're here with a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or maybe with your husband or wife, hopefully they're a friend. And when you think about friends, what's a friend? You know, what does it mean to have a friend? Well, if, who's a friend? Like a good friend is what? A, a friend is somebody who you enjoy spending time with and they enjoy spending time with you. You look forward to seeing them. A friend is somebody that you would do anything you could do, and within reason, you'd do anything for them, and they would do anything for you. 
A friend is somebody that you will challenge. You will speak truth into their life. You will confront them because you love them that much when they're going off the path. And you'll be like, hey, what are you doing? I, I care about you too much to let it go. But even if they don't listen and they blow it off and then they will land in a ditch at some point, you, you don't give up on them because they're a friend, right? You help them get out of the ditch. And right, it's a, it's a, that's a friend. And Jesus was a friend of sinners, meaning he loved being around people with that label. Now, I know we're all sinners, okay? And that's true. The Pharisees, religious people, all that. But every generation of religious people always tags certain sins. And it's always different from generation to generation. Certain sins is particularly sinful, and they get marginalized and get mistreated. And often they're the ones who get hurt by religious people. And it's, and, and it's tragic. But Jesus moved toward those people intentionally, and he was their friend. They were not ministry projects. They were his friends. So much so that when Matthew, this tax collector, was called by him, he, they had already had a relationship because Jesus was a friend of sinners, people like Matthew, who was a tax collector. Like I said, every generation of religious people sort of tags certain, certain sins as particularly sinful. Well, in that culture, it was 2,000 years ago, it was prostitutes, uh, those who collaborated with the Romans that had taken over Israel, the Gentiles, the Romans themselves, and then tax collectors. And they were the worst of the worst, which is kind of weird, right, for us. I mean, you think, okay, I mean, I, I, IRS agents may not be my favorite people in the world. I don't know. I don't know them, but maybe you do. Maybe you are one. We hired one as our, our in Espanol campus pastor. He used to be an IRS agent. We pulled him out of the sin thing, I guess. And, 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 but... Um, but right, it's just a job, right? But, but for that, back then it was different because the way it worked in the Roman system is that when Rome conquered a nation, they would hire people to be tax collectors who were from that nation because they knew what was up. They knew the people. They knew what the potential was. They couldn't be duped like, you know, just some foreign person coming in. And so in what, and the way that worked is if you wanted to be a tax collector because it was lucrative, you would sort of give this bid and you'd say, this is how much I believe in this area that I could collect. And Rome would say, okay, you win that bid. You, we're going to hold you accountable for that. And anything you raise above that is yours. We don't care how much above that. And so you could get really, really wealthy by sticking it to people that were your people. And that's why they were so hated. They, they were known to be uh, inscrupulous. They, they were known to be uh, corrupt and all of it. So they were like, they were the one, no matter what kind of sinner you were, they were the one person that you always felt good about yourself that you could always say, well, at least I'm not that. Like I may have just kicked a puppy for fun, which is the worst thing ever, but at least I'm not a tax collector. Okay. So that, that's Matthew. And understand it's not that like Matthew had been a tax collector 10 years ago. But since then, he's really gotten his life together and he's come around and now Jesus says, okay, you can be my disciple. Now he goes to the tax collector booth where he's working and collecting taxes. And he says, I want you, Matthew, to be one of my closest friends and disciples. And, and I'm going to give the whole Christian movement over to you one day is what that would eventually mean. It reminds me of an Oscar Wilde quote that I really love. It says where he said, every saint has a past whether they'll admit it or not, it's true. Everybody you're intimidated by, every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. And with Jesus, it becomes a really good future. And Matthew got it. And he's like, I am in. And then, the first instinct he has, which tells us so much, not only about Matthew, but even more about Jesus. The first instinct he has is, I've got to invite all my sinner friends that are marginalized, that aren't even allowed in church, in the synagogue. They're not allowed because they're so sinful. I've got to throw a party because I want them to meet Jesus because I know they'll love Jesus. And I certainly know Jesus will love them. And so he throws a sinner party and invites all these people. And Jesus and his disciples go. And I love that that's his instinct because think about it. If you wanted to throw a center party, wouldn't you think the, the best way to ruin it would be to invite a pastor? You know, like to invite your friends, you know, who are far from God and, you know, or, and you're like, oh, yeah, it's going to be a great party. In fact, I invited my pastor. And they'd be like, you what? 
He invited a pastor. And I know, I feel that because I'm a pastor. Like, I feel that thing. It's like, oh boy, here we go. Yeah, that's a pastor. And, uh, and it reminds me of a party a few years back of a really good friend of mine who is not a, a Jesus person. Um, he's a wonderful guy. I love him. But he's not a, and he's, he's a really great friend. And I, I mean a really great friend. And he's not a Christian. Um, and he's not following God and all that kind of stuff. But understand, he's not a project to me. I mean, I would love for him to come to know Jesus one day. And he knows that. And we talk about it. And, but it's not a one-way street. Like, he's really impacted me, too. He's, he's shown me what it means to... He's a much better friend than I am. He's loyal. He's sacrificial. He's encouraging. I mean, he's just a wonderful person. So he's turning 50. Now, in his past, he was a very uh, involved party person, like crazy party person, you know, for years. Kind of notorious Dallas party person. But by the time you get to 50, a lot of that kind of starts running out of your life. So, but on his 50th, he's like, you know, I want to bring the party back. And so he threw this big party and he invited me and he said, Jeff, the party, I really want you to be there, but I'm not inviting you to all of it. He said, the party's in three stages. Um, the first stage is just is dinner at a really nice place with 10 of my closest friends. And that's just going to be dinner with friends. And I really want you, you don't know all my friends yet. You know, some of them, not all of them. I really want them to meet you. And I really want you to be there. Stage two is going to be more people. and It's going to get crazy. Stage, th- stage three is even more people. And it's going to get off the hook crazy. And I don't want you to be there. You're welcome to do it anyway. I'm not going to chase you away, but it'll make me worried about you being uncomfortable. I don't want to make you uncomfortable. If people took pictures of you there, it would be a problem. But they put it, I'm like, I don't want any of that for you. So just, if, would you come to stage one? And I said, of course, I'd love to. So I go to stage one. So it's dinner at this place. And, I'm, and I intentionally sit with people that I didn't know of the 10. And right across, this is just a fun part of the conversation. So right, right across from me is this guy that I was meeting for the first time and he actually owned the restaurant. And, um, and so as, as we were talking, he's like, Hey, our friends told me all about you. You know, you're a pastor. And then he starts giving me a hard time and telling me some pastor jokes that were inappropriate. And, um, <laughs> then he said, you know what? I'm going to quit. I, I, I'll quit messing with you. He said, I, you know, he's told me that you're just a normal guy. Like you're a real guy. You're really authentic and that you just, you love him. He loves you. And you're not there to judge people, but you know, you're just there to, um, you know, you've got your commitment and your way of life and you understand that not everybody shares that. And, and, uh, and so, you know, you, you can, uh, you say, I'm, I'm just really happy to get to know you. And, and, and he said already, I can kind of understand why he thinks you're, you know, kind of normal and, uh, kind of, and, um, but then I love this. He said, in, in fact, I knew I, I've got to know a pastor in the area just a little bit on a trip. He said, because through some friends of my wife, I went on an Israel trip with this church, and I got to know the pastor in a way that he probably didn't want to get to know me. He said, here's what happened. We were, had a layover in London, and I had marijuana in my backpack. And they found it. And this is the way he said, he said, you know, those London people, they're pretty uptight about that. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, like, I tried to tell them it's no big deal, but they weren't buying it. Like, so that was a really big deal. I ended up getting arrested. Somebody from their staff had to stay back with me, and it was this whole big drama. And it got to be this whole big thing. And he said, I just, and so I'm sure he wishes he never knew me. But just so you know, he said, it's probably not going to be an issue for you. But if you ever go through London, just remember those British, they, they are pretty serious about that. And I was like, you know what? You're right. It probably is not going to be a big deal for me, but I appreciate your kindness and giving me the tip, you know? So that was the kind of conversation. It was fun. Um, and then they went on to stage two and stage three. And, and I actually drove away wondering, I wonder if Jesus would have gotten to stage two. I don't know. But I'm at least glad I was, they were comfortable enough with me to invite me to stage one. But it's the same kind of thing going on here, right? Where Matthew's like, man, I've got to, I've got to let my friends get to know Jesus. He didn't have a stage two and stage three because he's entering into a whole new life. But he just wanted his friends to meet him. And the more you know Jesus, the longer you go, the easier it is to be isolated from people that, and, and just not make time for those who are, don't know God yet and, and who are far from him. And Matthew is a great example, I think, of a person who is following a friend of sinners and who still maintains those friendships. I mean, yeah, he, he had all new friends now, too. He had intentional community, like we talked about a few weeks ago, with the other followers of Jesus, with the other 12 and others as well. And that's important. 
But it's also important that we also maintain these kind of relationships. And we'll see why as we look at the next group in the next character, and that is the Pharisees. Now, I'm going to say it again in just a little bit, the Pharisees. And what I do, I want you to boo really loud, okay? You ready? The Pharisees. Boo. Yeah, very good. Pharisees get a bad rap. Um, when we hear it, we always boo. And it's like, yeah, because we have the New Testament. We're like, oh, they're terrible. Because we know that, I mean, they, oh, yeah, those Pharisees, they're hypocritical. They're judgmental. They're arrogant. They look down their nose at people. They act like they're not sinners. And other people are, even though they are sinners, too. And all that, and all of that's true. However, that's not what they were going for. Um, their heart wasn't to be that. Their heart was to be godly. And they were regarded as godly people. Like they were impressive for, to people. Because they were just trying to be really good at being good. They were trying to do everything right. And, and stand for the truth, which is a good thing. Truth is wonderful. And to build their life around that. And all the, and all the little, they got overboard with legalism. But still, they were just trying to be really, really good. And they were trying to do everything right. And they were the best people on the planet at being good. And that's what they were trying to do. But they ended up missing the heart of God. And, and creating a version of spirituality that was anti-Jesus. Um. And one of the ways that happened is in their way of thinking that if they were going to maintain godliness and holiness is, is a you know, word for that in the Bible. That the way to do that is to separate yourself from people who didn't buy into, who didn't do all the stuff that you were committed to doing. And who didn't believe what you, the way you believe. And so you, because if you, if you rub shoulders with people, if you bumped into people, you would be contaminated. And in fact, the word Pharisee means a separatist. That's what it means. They were separatists. They separated themselves out from people who weren't like them and who weren't committed to the same things. Because um, it, it's kind of like cooties, you know, growing up. If you had that, I don't know. You know, where guys, you know, as little boys, we would get cootie shots. Little girls would get cootie shots, too, if they happened to touch a boy or, you know, in, on the playground or something, run into somebody. Remember, it was, I think, circle, circle, dot, dot. Now you have your cootie shot or something like that. Yeah, and, uh, and you do it on your little pen. And then you could go on the playground and not worry about it because you were inoculated against, you know. Um, so it's, you know, probably inappropriate. But, you know, so, I don't know, sexist and all that is a little teaching kids all kinds. Of, but, um, but anyway, we had that, right? But it's the same idea that you could get spiritual cooties if you hung out with people who were sinners. And that's why they had the different categories. We had us and then sinners, us and then them. And so the Pharisees, that's why they couldn't believe that Jesus would just hang out with people like Matthew and his friend. Like, how could they, how could he do that? And that's why they ask. I mean, it's a really honest question from their perspective when they pull the disciples together and, he, and they say, hey, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Because it made no sense. If he was a rabbi, if he was uh, claimed to be this holy guy, like, why does he do that? And Jesus doesn't wait for the disciples to answer. He overhears it and he answers. And he answers by giving a little mini sermon. And the sermon has three points. And I was taught when I was in grad school for pastors called seminary that you're, you know, to te the good sermons had three points. And I never preach that way. So I get an F, I guess, from all my professors uh, from seminary. But Jesus gets an A. He has three points. And we'll just go point by point. The first one is this. And we, well, first one is this. It is the healthy who need a doctor, not the sick. So he's saying, why would you hang out with these sinners? And he says, well, the, it's not the healthy who need a doctor. Meaning, he's comparing himself to, to being a doctor. Now, imagine a doctor who says, you know what? I love medicine. I have a lot of training. I just don't like to be around sick people. That kind of grossed me out. You know, I just, um, like, sometimes they're contagious or, you know, even if they're not contagious, there's all kinds of gross stuff that can happen, you know. And, and uh, like that, well, I, I was going to say the pimple popper person, but I won't, you know, because that's just gross. But, you, but I still watch it anyway. But I, it's like I can't not look. But, you know, but you think, okay, wait a minute. You know, I, just, I don't like being around sick people, so I never go to the hospital because it wigs me out. And, and I have an office, but we don't let sick people come in. You gotta be healthy. You gotta fill out this questionnaire. And, well, that's a waste of a doctor, right? A doctor is there for sick people. 
And what Jesus is saying is, hey, I, I'm here for sinners. I'm here for people who don't know God. I'm here for people who, yeah, their life is a wreck or, or is, you know, now that's every human being, right? But, but he's saying that, that's why I'm here. But the other part of that, too, that we need to understand is a doctor is not there to perpetuate sickness. A doctor isn't there to celebrate sickness or condone sickness or say, let's make more people sick. A doctor is there to help move people, transformation, right, from sickness to health. So when we talk about, you know, hanging out with people and all that, it's, it's with, in hopes that as we're being transformed, that we can also be influential in the life of other people. Not just to, you know, condone whatever's going on, but just hopefully to help see people move from that to something better and, and maybe to follow Jesus themselves, right? So, and yeah, that was a, 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 that's not the way the Pharisees thought. The way the Pharisees thought and why they were so frustrated with Jesus is that acceptance, if you accepted somebody, it means you agree with them. Acceptance equals agreement. And that's why they said in one passage, like, oh, he's a, he's a glutton and a drunkard because he hangs out with people who eat too much and drink too much at their parties. And he did hang out with parties where people ate too much and drank too much because that's what people did at those parties. He didn't. Because acceptance doesn't equal agreement. We can, agree, we can disagree with somebody and still accept them into our circle and, and still love them. And, and so what Jesus taught is that acceptance does not equal agreement. Now, you know, we think cancel culture is new, but it's at least 2,000 years old. Because the Pharisees, we, we just elevated it to a whole new thing. And it's sick. The whole idea that... I've got to bubble myself with people who think just like me and who live just like me. And if I don't, then I'm, that's like I'm accepting them or whatever. And they, that's something wrong. That's messed up. And, and we need to like stop it. Because if we want to see life change in our life and in other people, then that happens in the context of relationship. It happens in the context of acceptance. And that's the way Jesus, that's the way you see transformation in people's lives in the way Jesus lived is it was in the context of relationship. It's not like, hey, get your act together. Stop being a tax collector in 10 years. Let me know how it's going. And then that's not the way it works. That, that's why Paul says in, in the book of Romans, I think it's Romans 2, 9, that God's kindness leads to repentance. It's not that, his, that repentance leads to his kindness. It's the other way around. God's kindness leads to repentance, meaning that the, the, with like God accepts us as we are. That's his kindness, his grace. But he points us to repentance, toward changed life, toward living better, toward submitting to him. But that happens in the context of his grace and relationship. And as Christians, we can get like the Pharisees where we get so hung up by, we gotta, everybody's got to know what we think and what we believe and truth. And they've got to sign up for what. And, uh, and Jesus, you know what, just love people. And in the context of relationship, that'll, ha- that'll come. Like, that's good. But get the order right. Acceptance precedes transformation. Relationship precedes transformation. So that's the first thing. The second thing that, um, that he talks about, and this was, would have been offensive to them the way he started it. The second point, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now, as a teacher, that was a common thing for a rabbi to say, go and learn. You'd say, to your te- you'd say to your students, go and learn. I mean, you don't know this, so you need to go and learn this. But he wasn't talking to students. He was talking to Pharisees. He was talking to the people who had already graduated. They already had their PhD. They were the teachers. They weren't the ones being taught, is the way they would have seen it. So when Jesus says to them, go and learn, that would have already been like, you go and learn. You know, it's just like, no, I, I, I know every, I know what I need to know. But Jesus is saying, no, you don't. There's something you need to learn that you've really missing. And it's a Bible verse from Hosea. They would have known it. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Where God in the Old Testament, Hosea 6, 6, is talking to the nation who's really blowing it. It has turned spirituality on its head the same way the Pharisees did. And when he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, here's what that means. It's not, in context, it's not like sacrifice, like generally, like the way Ryan talked about it last week. Sacrificing my life for the sake of somebody else. That's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is the sacrificial system. 
and doing all these you know sacrifices the way you were supposed to do it exactly precisely and and uh, and we're going to do it just right and he's talking about religious ritual which is what the pharisees were really good at and what god was saying is you know I know you care a lot about that and you think that's what I care most about. And hey, all that's great. I mean, do it. I, you know, be good for you. But that's actually not what I care most about. What I care most about is mercy, which is a broad word translated from Greek. It means compassion, love, mercy. And what he's saying is the heart of God is love, is compassion. And that's what God wants most out of you as religious leaders. Not getting everything right. That's great. Get everything right and tell you it's good. I, you know, proud of you. But I don't care about that nearly as much as I care about you reflecting the heart of God to people that, I, that he loves. And if you get that wrong, then you get everything wrong. Here's my way of saying it. My little quote. I don't know if it's good or not, but I was proud of it when I wrote it. If we get religion right and love wrong, we have a perverse religion. And that's what the Pharisees had. You could insert, if we get truth right and love wrong, we have a perverse truth. Or if we get theology right, which I'm all for right theology, and love wrong, we have a perverse theology. At the core of everything is God's compassion, mercy, love. And if we get that wrong, we get everything wrong. But it's easy to get it wrong. In fact, there's a lot of that going on right now. And a lot of people being hurt rather than being pulled in and being loved. And, and Jesus would, is, is just as frustrated when we do that now as he was with the Pharisees who did that 2,000 years ago. They were just missing it. So that was his second point. The third point, for I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah who's bringing in God's kingdom to this planet, which is life as it was meant to be before sin ruined it. And he's restoring what life is meant to be, his kingdom life. And he said, the people that I'm inviting are not the, not the righteous, but the sinners. Now, that was opposite of the way they thought. The Pharisees were trying to be righteous so that when the Messiah came, they'd be picked as the ones to be in the kingdom. And God says, no, that's not the way it works. I don't pick righteous people. I pick unrighteous people. I'm here for sinners, not for righteous people. And that would have been like, what? To them. We're trying so hard to do this. And, and it's tongue in cheek because what he's letting them understand is everybody's a sinner. There's no righteous people. We're all sinners. Just because you're religious doesn't mean that you're not a sinner, right? You just have different sins than people who aren't, aren't religious. And, the, and so they would have started figuring that out. But he's saying, I'm here for the unrighteous I'm here for the sinner, meaning people who know. The only way you and I can come to know God is if we understand that we're sinners in need of a Savior. And he offers forgiveness and a whole new life. And the only people who can't come into God's kingdom is the perfect people. Imperfect people allowed, perfect people not allowed. And they constructed the opposite of that. And it's really easy to do that. A friend of mine a guy named Larry, Larry Osborne. My dad name was named Larry, so if you're named Larry, I already have a soft spot in my heart. I love Larrys. I've never met a Larry I didn't like. Have you ever met a Larry you didn't like? Don't answer that. But, um, but I, some of you may be with one. You're like, yeah. Um, but Larry Osborne, he wrote a book called Accidental Pharisees. It's a great book. He's a pastor in California. And Accidental Pharisees is just, actually, the, the Pharisees themselves were accidental Pharisees. They weren't trying to be the people we boo. It just happened accidentally. And the same thing is true today. You and I, we may boo the Pharisees, but the longer we know Jesus, the, higher, the longer we're a Christian, the, the higher probability that we'll slip into accidental Phariseeism. Which means one of the ways that happens, and the book is about all these different ways, but one of the ways is you start to look down your nose at people who struggle with things that you don't. And like I said, there's certain sins that always get picked on. And after a while, you start to, you know, follow God for a while. And there's certain, you actually do get better in certain things. And then you look at, at other people who are not, and you start looking down your nose at them. And you think, oh, man, I, I, I don't need to hang out with them. I don't want my kids to hang out with them. I don't want to, I mean, because they can contaminate. And you just get into that way of thinking. And, and we develop a little bubble around ourselves 
Because immorality is flourishing, and it is. And I don't, I'm not for immorality. I think immorality is really dangerous and destructive. And so when immorality you know, is flourishing in a world like ours, then it's all the more easier in fear to build a little bubble and just start hanging out with people like us who are committed to the same things. And so we have our little Christian bubble. And within that bubble, certain sins are kind of fine, like greed or materialism or arrogance or judgmentalism. or Those are fine. But these other sins are not fine. Like those are dangerous. We don't want those. And so we, we have our own little bubble and we become bubble people. And we're, we hang out with people who are like us and who think like us and who live like us. who have the same sins as us that we kind of pet sins. And we think that's a good thing. And it's actually really warped. And one of the best things it can do, it, it, it happen is burst the bubble. I, one of my favorite uh, TV episodes is Seinfeld when George Costanza they go to the bubble boy because does anybody know what I'm talking about where uh, Seinfeld, he, he want this bubble boy. He turns out to be not a boy, but an obnoxious adult is in this bubble and uh, for health reasons. And he wants to see Jerry Seinfeld because he's famous for his birthday. George gets there way earlier. So George goes in and they play trivial pursuit. The moops watch it. Okay. Go on YouTube and just put moops in. It's great. But they ended up getting a fight because of this typo, uh, not the Moors, but the Moops, and they get in a fight, and, uh, um, and the bubble bursts, and he has to go to the hospital, which I know is terrible. But what's even worse is, being in the, is forming our own Christian bubble. And Jesus was a bubble buster. And it's just so easy to do. And it's happening all over Christianity right now. And it's really messed up. And I understand why. Because it feels safer, feels like, yeah, we, you know, and, but you end up in an echo chamber. You end up just with people who are just like you are. You end up just like the Pharisees developing a, you, you turn spirituality in its head and you develop a very messed up version of Christianity and spirituality. That Jesus would be like, that's gross. And so you have to burst the bubble. So, um, that's, that's the Pharisee. So you've got, and I want you to think about it. who are you in the story? Jesus, like more like Jesus, more like Matthew, more like the Pharisee. And of course, all of us would love to be more like Jesus, right? And so, what does that look like? Well, let's think about it. What does that look like for us as a church, like us? And then I'll talk about you and me individually. As a church, I think that means to illustrate the heart of Jesus that we will be a friend of center church. And by the way, we're all sinners, remember? But a friend of center church. Meaning we will be a church, not just for church people, but for those who don't go to church and those who are, are not just trying to be godly, but those who are far from God. And we try really hard to do that. And we're trying to get better at it. And if you're new in our church, you may wonder why we do certain things. And one of the biggest reasons we do what we do is that we're a church, not just for church people, but even more importantly, for those who don't go to church and for those who are outside the faith. Because that's the mission that gave birth to the church. We don't do that because it's cool or because it's trendy, because it's actually not right now. But we do it because Jesus is the Lord of the church. It's his church. And what gave before the church, there was the mission. So God sends the, the, God the Father sends God the Son, Jesus, into the world on a rescue mission. To seek and save the lost is the way he said it. He ascends to heaven. He sends the, God the Holy Spirit to empower the group of believers called church built around a mission where Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And that's you and me. We are sent into this world. And the church is his missionary movement, his rescue movement on this planet to move toward the least and the lost. And that's why we're here. We're not here for us. We're here for that mission. And when we start making it about us, we make a perverted version of Christianity that I think God's kind of disgusted by but the Holy Spirit is waiting to empower a church on mission. And so that's who we want to be increasingly. And so if you, I mean, if you want a church that's just built around church, I can, show, I can if, email me and I'll give you some ones to try and enjoy. I mean, I, that's fine. But that's just not who we are. And, and increasingly, I hope that's not who we are. And that's us. And then there's you and me. What does this mean for you and me? What does it mean for you and me to live like Jesus? It means that we choose to be a friend of fellow sinners, including those who are labeled, you know, in a certain way where they're like the real sinners. 
that we go toward people who don't know God, not isolate ourselves from that. And realizing that God has placed us in our school, in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our family, in our golf club, whatever you do, God has placed us there with that purpose and to increasingly say, man, I, I, I want to I wanna let people know, like Matthew did, I, I want to let people know how much Jesus loves them by loving them and relating to them. And so here's the challenge for this week when it's a friend of sinners. If you go on the app, uh, you'll see a couple of things. One is you'll see an interview, a Wings with Jeff interview that I have with a friend of mine who does this really well. And that's why I interviewed him. And so he talks about what does it mean to be a friend of sinners as a church? What does it mean to live that way as individuals? And then, um, and then there'll even be a little thing where he looks at you for like five minutes in the camera and says, hey, this is, what I, this is how I challenge you to live in the world that you are. And I, I think it's just super helpful. But here's the challenge. This week, or at least try to schedule it this week, just hang out with somebody who is outside of church, outside of Christianity. Hang out with somebody. They may be far from God. God may be working on I don't know. But just, just initiate. Uh, and I would, I would make it even specific. Go to dinner. Or go get Froyo if you don't want to pay for dinner. But go, if you're cheap. But go for dinner. And just, and, and the reason is, I, I, when you look at how Jesus operated and, and how he lived, and what does it mean to be a friend of sinners? He went to parties and he ate a lot of meal. He ate a lot of food. That, the way John Mark Comer uh, words it is, um, Jesus reached people one meal at a time. And he did, when you look at what he did. Because that's just disarming, right? And it, it, you don't have to go to try to convert them by the dessert or anything like that. Or You're just there to be a friend. And God is at work in their life. He, he's, he's the one that creates spiritual interest. So over time, God, there'll, there'll be time. You don't have to hide who you are and what's important to you and your faith. You can talk about that. But also, just be a friend. And um, the way probably somebody was a friend in your life, my guess is you were reached. The reason you're here is because of a friend. I know I, that's true for me. I mean, when I was in you know, junior high going into high school, it was a friend who invited me to a youth group. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. And he was just good enough of a friend to reach out to somebody like me. And so think about, well, who would that person be? And just go to dinner. And start there and see what happens and see what God does. And pray about it and just say, God, I, and, and how can I just be a good friend? And allow God to work. Because if we don't, we'll miss what God is doing in mission. But we'll also, if we just hang out with people who think like us, we'll develop a very warped Christianity. And we'll find ourselves being the un-Jesus, not the Jesus-like. And we don't want that. And I wasn't planning to say this. I just believe God wants me to. Some of you are people that have been labeled... In ways and in, in hurt by church and rejected by church because of for whatever reason. And I'm sorry. Because that's not the way of Jesus. And about once a month, I have a conversation with somebody who says, Can I be here? Because they've been hurt and wounded by some church in some place. And I'm sure occasionally we blow it too. And in fact, two weeks ago, somebody asked me that. And, and I, I made it so complicated. I felt, I've been, I felt so convicted by it because I said, yes, of course you're welcome here. But then I gave, but here's what we believe. Here's what we teach. And you need to know that. Because I believe in truth. I, I, you know, I, I think it's better to submit. We had to give a whole week on that in this series. But I, I walked away and it just felt like the Holy Spirit convicted me. Why did you make that so complicated? Why didn't you just say, yes. Of course you can be here because you're loved by God beyond reason. And we love you too. Yes, you can be here, of course. And I blew it. And I just want you to hear the truth and understand God's character. So let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, um, Would you help us to get your heart right? That you desire, more than anything else, compassion. Not getting everything right. 
And Father, I mean, help us get stuff right. We want to get stuff right. But would you really help us get the most important thing right? And that is love and compassion and mercy. As a church and as individuals, God, help us, just as you've befriended us, help us befriend others in your name. And and would you help us be effective in this? And, And in all these dinners that happen, whether it's in our home or in a restaurant or wherever, God, I pray that you would just move and work and just start with helping us just be interested in loving people and and be responsive to whatever you do and all those meals. And we thank you that we are people who have been pulled in and, and help us represent you well in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.